let me introduce myself briefly and then uh, we'll begin. Uh, my name is Stuart Umpleby. I'm a professor in the Department of Management at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Uh, as a graduate student, I worked with Ross Ashby and Heinz von Forster at the University of Illinois in Urbana. And uh, I think in my biography, it describes some of the things I've been involved with since then. <coughs> I've been involved with the American Society for Cybernetics uh, over the years. So this tutorial is called Management Cybernetics. And as I said, it's going to be an overview of a number of different theories and approaches uh, to the field of cybernetics. Would it help if we close that door? I think I'm, I'm getting some noise. Okay, well, at least we can cut down on the background noise a little bit. I guess the, that won't be picked up by the mic. <coughs> Since there are a, a large number of conceptual systems that are related to the field of management and business, uh, one could easily ask the question, can this large number of perspectives all be right uh, or all be useful? And I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, but it does require, I think, a sort of higher level understanding of the way we use knowledge and interact with organizations. And so that's, what I, that's the sort of underlying theme of what I'll be talking about. I'll be explaining several quite different perspectives. And what I'd like you to notice and appreciate is the great difference in these different perspectives, even though uh, they all are used and have been helpful. Uh, in the field of management and business. So you can even classify the different perspectives. You can have the professional approaches like finance, accounting, marketing, personnel, administration. Then there are uh, approaches that are based in disciplines like organizational behavior is based in psychology, operations research is based in engineering and mathematics, decision analysis also. Uh, and information systems is based in computer science. Uh, <coughs> or you can have a classification of knowledge in the field of management based on the type of organization. For example, small business, international business, public administration. Now management cybernetics is different from these other approaches uh, in that it is uh, quite clearly interdisciplinary. The uh, goal underlying cybernetics has been to develop a uh, language that can be used by people from many different disciplines uh, as a kind of uh, communication device uh, between fields. So cybernetics addresses organizations of any size or type and it tends to focus on the organization as a whole rather than just a part. And also it emphasizes cognitive processes, information processing and decision making, learning, adaptation, etc. So in my presentation today, uh, I'll be discussing the work of Edwards Deming process improvement methods, uh, which is not usually included within cybernetics, but I think it should be. Uh, the work of Stafford Beer, which sort of founded the field of management cybernetics. Uh, Russ Acoff, uh, whose work is usually associated with systems theory, but I think it fits quite nicely into cybernetics. And then the work of Forrester and Singe, uh, and two other people whom you may not have heard of, Elliot Jacks and Gerard Endenberg, both of whom I think have done uh, very interesting work that uh, needs to be uh, more well known. So as I said, there are many ways to think about management. Only a few attempt a holistic approach. Uh, there are great differences even among the holistic views, uh, but each one of these can be useful. Um, let's see. <coughs> now, there is one idea underlying cybernetics and the work that I'm doing today that I should alert you to. And that is the definition of complexity. Uh, those people who talk about complex systems or complexity theory, 
very often assume that a complexity exists in the system that's observed. Uh, in other words, complexity is out there in the world. Uh, cybernetics uh, feels much more comfortable with the notion that complexity is in the mind of the observer. This goes back as far as Kolmogorov's notion that complexity can be measured by the length of the description. Uh, this is quite compatible with the notion that um, different people see different things, or at least different people focus on different things. Just as I showed you earlier, some people focus on financial aspects of an organization, some people on marketing, some people on personnel. Each one of these descriptions can be complex, but the complexity lies in the choices made by the observer in terms of what the observer is interested in. So I would just uh, alert you to that and to say that what I'm going to be speaking about today is this uh, constant interaction between the observer and the system observed, where the observer is constantly reinterpreting uh, and reconceptualizing the system that he or she is working with. <clears throat> now, underlying that idea, or associated with that, is the notion that using any analytic method is better than using no analytic method. And the reason for that is both the law of requisite variety and the very famous paper by George A. Miller called the magical number seven, plus or minus two. Uh, this is the idea that the human brain can distinguish about seven categories and can work with them at any one time. So the way you deal with complexity is that you create hierarchies of categories so that, for example, a book usually has about seven chapters and in each chapter you have about seven subdivisions and within each subdivision you may have additional subdivisions. If you have 32 subdivisions, you'll tend to say, well, you ought to organize it a little bit more, create some categories. If you only have one or two, then you think that's not enough. So the brain works very easily or very well with about seven categories and we organize knowledge in that way. <coughs> and then the law of requisite variety uh, which is described in the earlier tutorial, uh, says that the amount of selection can, that can be performed is limited by the amount of information available. Uh, in other words, if you want to make a stock, stock market selection of a company to invest in, you need information on the companies. If you don't have information, <laughs> you have no rational grounds for selection. Or the law of requisite variety can be interpreted as saying that the variety in the regulator must be at least as great as the variety in the system being regulated. Um, if the system you're trying to regulate can display greater variety than you can comprehend, then you're at a significant disadvantage. So the purpose of using analytic methods in understanding an organization is to create a conceptualization that both the brain can handle and that encompasses enough variety such that you can keep on top of any situation uh, that arises. So the first point of view that I will go over is process improvement methods. Uh, that have been developed by people such as um, Edwards Deming, Duran, Feigenbaum, Crosby, etc. Uh, these are very well known now. Uh, they were developed going back as early as the 1930s. Uh, they were used during World War II and the construction of war material. And after World War II, Deming and others took these methods to Japan to improve the um, uh, productivity of the Japanese economy, which worked very well. The Japanese adopted them, used them, and uh, by, the by 1980, American companies were having trouble competing uh, with American firms. And then the Americans finally figured out what the Japanese were doing, and now these methods are being used around the world. Um, ISO 9000 is one variation of these methods. Uh, the Baldridge Award in the United States uh, is another process that helps people, uh, companies, to use these methods. 
So these methods have had a dramatic effect uh, on the relative competitiveness of nations. And I would say they're the most influential management methods of the latter part of the 20th century, uh, which is why I think that they uh, are important. And they embody Ross Ashby's theory of adaptive behavior, uh, which I will explain uh, when we get to that. So they're a very uh, straightforward illustration of cybernetics. Uh, <clears throat> this is just a picture of the Deming Prize. Um, the, in 1980, there was a um, TV program produced by NBC called If Japan Can, Why Can't We? Um, and in that TV program, Edwards Deming was introduced to the United States. Uh, he had been treated uh, almost as a god in Japan uh, between 1950 and 1980 but he was almost unknown in the United States. So after this TV program, people became aware of Deming and his work and began to listen to him, and that's soon thereafter the Baldrige Award was established. Uh, the way Deming presents his work is uh, he will say that uh, he did not bring the idea of quality to Japan, that Japan already had the idea of quality. What he took was the idea of a system. And this is what he meant by a system. Uh, it's a very simple concept of a flow from inputs to outputs and then a redesign process where you go back and you constantly redesign. So you have both the work in the process and the work on the process. And that's uh, the connection to Ashby's uh, theory adaptive behavior, which I'll describe as we go. Now, there are many ways that you can work out these models. This is something AT&T developed. It's a little worksheet to list uh, who your customers are, what you provide to them, and is there a quality gap between what I provide and what I want. And it, you think in terms of a process. You're a part of a process and you look at your customers and then your suppliers. So this is a way of looking at your customers. You can also look at your suppliers here who are your suppliers, what do they provide me, and is there a quality gap between what I get and what I want. So it's very easy to do worksheets on these things. The, the advantage of working on processes was described by Deming in this way. This is what he presented to Japan in 1950 uh, when he went back and uh, talked to the high-level executives in Japan. Uh, when he went over initially, uh, he had been invited by the MacArthur uh, General Douglas MacArthur was administering Japan, and they decided that um, they needed a census. So they invited over some people to teach the Japanese how to do a census. And Deming was one of those statisticians. But Deming also became concerned about the Japanese because the Japanese economy was uh, in bad shape. And they needed to export in order to import, and their reputation for export quality was not good. So Deming taught them how to improve quality. And the idea was that if you improve quality, costs decrease because of less we rework, uh, productivity improves, you capture the market with better quality, lower price, so you stay in business and provide jobs and more jobs. And what was happening in the United States in 1980 was that the jobs were going overseas. So the idea of total quality management emerged in the United States. Uh, Deming never introduced the term quality total quality management, but the elements of it uh, were uh, <coughs> characteristic of what the Japanese were doing. Uh, the basic idea that is usually not fulfilled is constancy of purpose, long-term commitment. I'll get to that in a minute. But the basic notion is that you don't see the results with process improvement for about four or five years, and that's why you need this long-term commitment. You do think of an organization as a collection of processes. Uh, in each one of the methods that I'll be describing to you, there's an underlying concept. And the underlying concept in quality improvement is that you view an organization as a collection of processes where you can use the same methods to improve any process. So you have a common language to be used throughout the organization. Uh, you use quantitative methods, that is you measure error rate and uh, cycle time and you need to do that in order to decide whether a change is actually an improvement so that you're constantly experimenting 
with changes in how to manage the process. Uh, so you're doing continuous improvement all the time, not just from time to time. You, you formulate a, a partnership with suppliers. The focus is on the customer. So if there's ever any debate about what should be done in the organization, you don't ask the manager, you ask the customers. Uh, leadership is needed to implement these methods and to bring about the, the cultural change that's required. And then you involve all your employees and training in these methods is essential. Okay, now this is from Schuert. The original idea was you design it, make it, and sell it. But with the Schuert cycle, Deming worked with Schuert at uh, the Hawthorne Works in the 1930s. Uh, you are constantly uh, changing it. And notice what you have here. You have uh, an institutionalization of the scientific method. That is, when you test an idea, you are, in a sense, testing a hypothesis. Uh, so the, the great power to process improvement methods is that you are having all of your workers throughout the company engage in scientific experiments on production processes, where the results of the experiment are not put in reports that go onto a shelf, but are used to modify the processes. So it's a continuous improvement of a, a quite remarkable nature. Now, process improvement entails a cultural change. And culture, in this case, is what we mean when we talk about beliefs and values. So that you have the old system and the new system. And the old system was that you focus on motivating people. And if something goes wrong, uh, as opposed to removing barriers, here the problem is you have to motivate people, otherwise nothing will happen. Under the new point of view, the notion is that people are already motivated, but the reason that they're not as productive as that they could be is that there are barriers that exist that could be removed. If something goes wrong in the old system, you engage in a period of blame storming, trying to figure out who to blame for the problem. Uh, but in the new point of view, you look at the system and you say, what went wrong with the system? Let's try to improve the system so that this problem does not arise again. Um, that shift of point of view has a tendency to bring forth information that you would not get if you were engaged in a uh, blaming activity. Uh, in the old point of view, you define responsibility. Here you define procedure. That's a, another way of saying what I just said. Uh, here you watch the bottom line. There you watch the quality. Uh, here you measure people. There you measure the system as a, as a whole. And if you do that, then people will help one another more. Uh, here you define the job. There you define the customer so that everybody is trying to work together to please the customer, not just to do their individual job. Uh, here you fix deviations, there you reduce variability, uh, etc. So uh, the studies that have been done on quality improvement and its effectiveness in organizations uh, indicate that it's not the specific methods that are used in process improvement, it's rather the cultural change. It's an openness to bringing forth information that makes the big difference uh, in adopting process improvement methods. Now, <coughs> the, um, the point that I want to emphasize is this concept of two processes, which I indicated before. The idea uh, in process improvement is that everybody engages in two activities, working in the process and working on the process. Working in the process refers to your normal activity of producing or delivering service, whatever it might be. Working on the process is a reinterpretation of the process. It's a redesign of the process. It's a re-engineering of the process. And you have to give people time to do that. It may be a two-hour session once a week uh, or something else. But People need to be given time to work on the process. And that is, uh, let's see, I'll come to that in a minute. Well, <coughs> the methods of process improvement do give you a common language so that normally you might find that hourly workers are asking, how many units did I produce? 
Middle management asks how much overtime did we work this week, and top management is asking what is my return on investment. But with process improvement, everybody asks the question, what is the level of quality uh, in the process that they are concerned with and in the organization as a whole? <coughs> it's also not sufficient to look only at one's own organization. Uh, when Motorola, uh, back in the early 80s, discovered process improvement methods and adopted them, uh, they were very pleased uh, because their uh, performance was constantly increasing. But then they did some benchmarking. They looked at their competitors and they found that their competitors were improving faster than they were. So even though they were constantly improving, they were falling farther and farther behind. Uh, so you have to um, monitor your competitors. Okay, now here is an expanded version of the Schuert cycle that I showed you earlier. And it's uh, an expanded version of um, the way that you go about doing a process improvement. And later I will get, uh, walk you through a specific example. But this is just a, a little uh, reminder, focus PDCA, uh, as a way of remembering what the process is. And as I said, this is, um, it's an expansion of the scientific method as applied to, to uh, organizations. So you first, F, find a process to improve, organize a team that knows the process, that is the people who work in the process, clarify current knowledge of, of the process. The problem there is that as soon as you define a flow chart of a process, that is an enormously educational activity because frequently people only know what they're doing and one or two people on each side of them. But if they see the process as a whole, then they can begin to imagine uh, improvements so that just looking at the process as a whole can be very helpful uh, when you begin. So you clarify current knowledge of the process. And that includes what is the cycle time, how long does it take to get from the beginning and the end, uh, and you look at the outputs, and you look at what the customers think of your outputs. And you look for sources of variation. Uh, variation is a key concept in Deming's point of view, which I'll explain in a moment. And then you select the process improvement. This can be the result of a brainstorming activity or whatever, but that's your hypothesis to be tested. So then you design an experiment. You plan an experiment, you conduct the experiment, collect data on the experiment, and then you act appropriately. In other words, if it improved the process, great. Then you test it on a larger scale, and then a larger scale, and then you finally implement it throughout the organization. If it doesn't work, then you go back and select another process improvement or another hypothesis and test that. Now in terms of Ashby's theory of adaptation, uh, which is explained in the earlier tutorial. <coughs> Ashby was concerned with the origin of adaptive behavior uh, in both individuals and machines. And he suggested that if a machine or organization or organism uh, could display two levels of feedback, that is feedback uh, and then another feedback loop, that encompasses it. So you think of two nested feedback loops, an inside one and an outside one. Then the inside feedback loop allows you to learn what behavior works in a specific environment. In other words, if something works, you repeat it. If it doesn't work, you don't repeat it. And that learning process is a very elementary process, but it works. Over time, you adopt a pattern of behavior that fits with the environment. But sometimes the environment changes. And you have to detect that <coughs> and then say, okay, <laughs> what, I was, what worked before doesn't work anymore, so I have to learn something new. And in a simple system, you just zero out what you've learned and you go through a learning process again. Well, that uh, activity of zeroing, zeroing out what you previously learned or beginning a new learning activity uh, is the second feedback loop. So the first feedback loop operates frequently and makes small corrections. The second feedback loop uh, makes infrequent but rather drastic corrections. 
And that's what you're doing with process improvement methods. That is, you learn how it, to do something, you, you establish a process, and then you're constantly improving it. You're constantly checking it. Uh, and that's what makes the organization adaptive. So a suitably structured organization uh, using process improvement methods will be adaptive. This is the idea of two nested feedback loops. Okay, so let me go back now to uh, a key concept underlying process improvement as Deming understood it. In fact, Deming said that if he could boil down uh, his message uh, to just a few words, it'd say it all had to do with reducing variation. And when Deming speaks of variation, he's thinking as a statistician, and in particular, he's thinking in terms of control charts. Uh, now, control charts, you have a sort of mean performance, and then you have an upper control limit and a lower control limit, which is defined by three standard deviations on either side of the mean. Those of you who remember statistics know that three standard deviations encompasses 99% of the uh, variation. And this allows you to distinguish common cause variation from special cause variation. Uh, <coughs> let's take as a sim simple example these tables. We have in this room several tables. Uh, all are approximately the same dimensions. If you were to measure those tables very carefully, you would find there's a little bit of variation in the length, the width, the height, and so forth. So that's the standard variation in the production of those tables. If you're monitoring the output of your factory on terms of length, width, and height of your tables, uh, you would expect that they would all lie within some common variation. If you find data outside the region, then you would expect that there's something wrong with the production process. Either a machine needs adjustment, or a worker needs to be trained, or some supply was uh, incorrect. So you would look to fix that special cause variation. Now this was extremely important to uh, Demi because in a sense it tells the manager where to focus the manager's attention. Uh, that is, the manager should be focusing, or the workers in charge of the process, should be focusing their attention on special cause variation, not on common cause variation. And the claim is that managers, in fact, spend a great deal of their time reacting to individual occurrences which are only common cause variation. Uh, let me explain it this way. <coughs> Let's say you have a manager, and he's trying to be helpful to his subordinates. So when they do well, he says, good job. And when they do poorly, he says, what happened? And he thinks that's what he's supposed to be doing, uh, congratulating them when they do well and letting them know when they do not so well. Now the problem with this um, approach to management uh, is several. Uh, let me tell you the story about uh, uh, some guys that won a Nobel Prize, Kahneman, and uh, he often worked with Tversky. And uh, they were giving a talk to their, uh, their classes on basic psychology. And um, the lecturer said uh, that the behavioral literature says that when you reward somebody, that works. If you punish somebody, that doesn't work. And one of the students raised his hand and said, that's wrong. <laughs> and the instructor said, well, why? Tell me, why do you think that? And uh, so the instructor says, well, I'm a flight instructor. I teach people how to fly airplanes, okay? And if they do a good job and I congratulate them, the next day they do worse. But if they mess up and I let them know it, the next day they do better. So obviously, Punishment works, rewards don't work. So how do we compare this experience of the flight instructor with the behavioral science literature which says that rewards work, punishment doesn't work? 
Well, it's very easy to explain in terms of the notion of common cause variation and special cause variation. The claim would be that these statements, good job and what happened, all lie within the realm of common cause variation. Uh, the technical term would be that the flight instructor is tampering, that he's, uh, he's interfering in a process and attempting to alter what is common cause variation, which can't be altered. But he doesn't know that. So if you do not distinguish between common cause variation and special cause variation, life will teach you that punishment works and rewards don't work. But if you understand common cause variation and special cause variation, then you can limit your interventions to those that really matter. And the reason why it works this way is something called regression to the mean. Uh, those of you with, who know statistics know that, that if you're above the mean, the chances are the next instance will take you lower. If you're below the mean, the chances are the next data point will take you up. That's called regression to the mean. So if you're not distinguishing between common cause variation and special cause variation, then regression to the mean will tell you that punishment works and uh, rewards don't work. But the behavioral science literature says the reverse. So I like this example because it brings together both statistics and psychology. But it's very important for the process improvement literature because it tells managers where they should focus their attention. Now, the problem with this analysis of common cause variation and special cause variation is that it works primarily in areas where you can make quantitative measurements. But if you want to implement process improvement methods in places which uh, outside manufacturing, like education or healthcare, where you have less opportunities to make quantitative measurements, then how do you do that? One method that I've found to be quite useful is something called the Quality Improvement Priority Matrix. And I learned of this by attending meetings of the Baldrige Award. The Baldrige Award is awarded every year in Washington, D.C., the Washington Hilton Hotel. Uh, you can go there and listen to the people who have won describe how they won the award. And one of the uh, methods that I learned during that is the quality improvement priority matrix, which can be thought of as an alternative to control charts as a way of uh, telling managers where they should focus their attention. <coughs> so I'm going to explain to you quickly now what a quality improvement priority matrix is and how you can use it. It's, uh, it's a very easy to use method and uh, has been used by many Baldrige Award winners and it seems to be spreading. Uh, when I teach in Washington um, each year more and more of my students say, oh, we use a process like that. Uh, so it seems to be catching on. So it's a way of focusing management attention on high priority tasks. Uh, it can be seen as an alternative to control charts. Uh, what you do is you, look, you list the features of an organization uh, and you can interview either your customers or your employees or your suppliers. And you combine their data, but you list a number of features. For example, if you have employees, uh, it might be salaries, office space, health care benefits, et cetera. I've done this with uh, my colleagues in the Department of Management at George Washington University over a period of several years, uh, and it tells us uh, what, the, what people think needs to be worked on. So it's a way of giving you a set of priorities. <coughs> but you ask uh, on two dimensions, importance and performance, how are we doing on a scale from one to nine? Uh, how important is this issue, like salaries, and how are we doing in terms of health care benefits or parking or something else? And then you end up with a matrix. Here's uh, the early matrices that we ended up with. As you can see, uh, most of the items were rated high on importance. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come up. Uh, and they were about evenly distributed on performance. 
But we started off with 52 uh, issues. They included things like travel support, office security, uh, websites, English skills of students, et cetera. Uh, and you can then list the um, priorities, uh, either by importance or by performance, and that was a problem. Uh, you can list them either by importance or by performance, or you can list the ones that were always in the southeast quadrant. Um, the, the issue is of interest is this southeast quadrant, because those are the items that are high on importance and low on performance. So in a sense, those are your priorities. But if you look at this diagram, you see that's about 50 percent of the items. So you want to break it down a little more. One way is to take the mean rather than take the midpoint of the axis. You could take the mean. That gives you a reduced set of items to focus on. But in working with this, we also came up with the IP ratio, that is the uh, improvement performance ratio. And you can then define intervals on this ratio, and that gives you a com combination of importance and performance. And you can then say that these items here are urgent, high priority, medium priority, and low priority. Or in this case, this is urgent, high priority, medium priority, low priority. Uh, that's a much more useful ranking because then you don't have to break things down by either importance or performance. We've also, uh, you can do this over time, and if you do it over time, you can watch the points move. And if they move in this direction, they're going from high priority to low priority. Occasionally, they move in this direction, which means they've gone up in priority. Uh, as an example, uh, the university built a new building, and some of our departments moved out of the building, which meant that the old other departments had more space. And sure enough, all the office space, classroom space issues improved. What also happened was that websites went up on importance, and we hadn't realized that, that the faculty, this was several years ago, that the faculty was using websites more. So with this method, you can do several things. You can establish priorities. Uh, of a democratic nature as opposed to a sort of top-down nature. Uh, you can track your progress <coughs> in terms of seeing how the dots move over time, and you can discover uh, new issues. So it's efficient in terms of time and resources. It only takes a few minutes to fill out one of these questionnaires each year. It provides enough precision for monitoring changes in priorities, and it's, and it's based on subjective data, which is both a uh, an asset and a disadvantage. It's an asset in that you can use it in any organization. Uh, it's a disadvantage because you have to uh, you have to think about you know just how important is their subjective dissatisfaction with something, and you can take it into other uh, domains. Okay, so. Uh, other features of process improvement have to deal with uh, customer information. Now, the point that I want to make here is that uh, process improvement says that you shouldn't just wait around for something to go wrong and then fix what it is that goes wrong. Rather, you should be engaged in a constant process of finding things that you can improve even while things are going well. And the quality improvement priority matrix is one way of allowing you to do that. That is, it gives you an agenda for what to focus your attention on, and it tells you if you focus your attention on these urgent or high priority items, you will get a high return in the satisfaction of your employees or your customers. And you can do that while everything is working well. So rather than a passive approach to collecting information on what is wanted, you can have a more active approach of interviewing and monitoring uh, customer satisfaction and then acting on the things that are rated low in performance. Now let me say just a little bit about cost and uh, return, because that's what causes these efforts to not be continued, uh, a point that I made earlier, that 
uh, there was a time during the 80s and 90s when many organizations started a quality improvement program and after a few years they canceled it. Uh, and the reason was I think they didn't understand the cost uh, and the way things work. So think of your total costs as the cost of producing goods or services, the cost of producing waste or errors, which I'll explain in a minute, and the cost of doing quality improvement. And the idea is that you spend here and save here. You can think of it this way. <clears throat> In the normal production process, uh, you can have chronic waste, uh, scrap, uh, excess inventory, inspection equipment, tax equipment, cost of energy, etc. People's time, rework, inspection, checking, clarifying, producing waste or per quality. In other words, if you produce a large number of widgets and throw away 10 percent or 20 percent, all of the material and the time and the machine time that you spent producing the ones you threw away was waste. So if you can reduce the amount of waste that you produce, uh, that's pure savings. You also have a cost in lost sales uh, and in capital, uh, warranty costs, liability costs, et cetera. So here's the way you get a return. Uh, what you spend on your quality improvement program is indicated by this line here. In other words, you start off training people. You do uh, a few process improvement projects, and then you use those as examples to teach other people in the organization how to do this. And your return initially is very low, but there comes a time when your return ramps up, and that's your gain. But this takes four or five years. So if you start your quality improvement program and then you cancel it after a few years, which has happened many times, then you don't cash in on the gains. And then the uh, additional suggestion is that what do you do with the gains? Well, you give them some, at least some of them back to the employees so that you share with the employees and as a result you get more suggestions. Let me tell you a story that um, Russ Acoff once told. He does a lot of management consulting. He went to some firm. Uh, the manager of the firm was very happy. He said, um, my workers have just told me uh, about a change in our production process that's going to save us $8 million a year. And so Acoff says, that's great. Uh, I'd like to talk to the workers. So he goes and he talks to these two guys. And he says, I understand that you made a recommendation that's going to save the company several million dollars a year. That's great. They say, yep, that's us. We did that. And so then Acoff says, uh, tell me, how long have you been working for the company? And they said, 10, 12 years. And so then Acoff said, well, uh, I'm curious. He says, when did you come up with the idea that would save the company several million dollars? And they sort of looked down and shuffled their feet and said, well, two or three months after we arrived. And so he said, well, why didn't you tell anybody then? And they answered, no one asked. So the point is <coughs> that the people who work in processes have a lot of knowledge about how to improve the processes. But you have to set up a system that asks them for their suggestion and that tests their suggestions because their suggestions may not take account of the, the whole system. So you have to talk it through, do an experiment, test it on a larger scale. And if you do that and you turn your people into constant innovators, then you get uh, improvement. And the idea is that prevention gives you more leverage than correction. Correction in the field is a lot more uh, costly. So <coughs> process improvement methods use the scientific method of testing hypotheses. Uh, improvements are made not just by scientists and engineers, but by all workers working both in the process and on the process, and what is learned is immediately put into practice. How many of you have heard of the distinction between mode one and mode two knowledge? Nobody? Well, I'll explain that later in the day. This is, in a sense, an instance of mode two knowledge. Mode one knowledge is traditional scientific research. It's like 
uh, the research that led to the invention of the transistor, which then went through applied research and was incorporated eventually into uh, products uh, like the Sony Walkman and computers, uh, et cetera. That would be mode one knowledge, uh, theoretical research down to applied research. Mode two knowledge is what I've just described. Uh, it's process improvement knowledge done not by scientists and engineers, but by workers who are constantly modifying and improving the processes that they work in. So let me walk you through an example of process improvement in a university hospital to illustrate what I've been talking about. This is a true story. It comes from uh, the George Washington University Hospital. They decided to implement a quality improvement program. It was run by a person named Roger Chalfournier, who was a doctoral student uh, in management. And they chose as one of their early projects uh, the medication turnaround time. Now, there are two departments in the hospital, nursing and pharmacy. They had been in a long-term state of war. This sometimes happens in organizations. They were blaming each other. They had formed a committee that had met for two years to address this problem. But mostly they just pointed fingers at each other and didn't make any progress. So they decided to adopt process improvement methods. So a quality improvement team was formed. They formulated an opportunity statement, which is there's an opportunity to improve medication turnaround from the time a physician writes an order to the time it is administered to the patient. An improvement will benefit patients, physicians, nursing staff, and pharmacy. So first thing they did was they made a flow chart. They said the order is written, is the chart available? Now in a hospital, each patient has a chart that shows the history of medications given to them and what his allergic reactions are and so forth. And you have to check the chart because you don't want to give the patient a medication that he or she is allergic to. Okay. Is the order reviewed? Okay, then you review it according to these criteria. Uh, and then this is sort of detailed. You pull a yellow copy and so forth. Pharmacy picks it up. The order is delivered to pharmacy. Uh, what's that say? Order is checked. Is it okay? It's checked according to these criteria here. The order is entered in the computer. It's filled. The order is delivered to the unit. And the medication is delivered to the patient. So that's the process. What they needed to know was where are the delays happening? So you attach a cover sheet to each order, each uh, prescription. And the cover sheet says the time that it was written by the physician, when the time it was placed in the pharmacy box, when the order was picked up by the technician, when the order was entered in the pharmacy, the order label was promised, processed, the order is delivered to the medical unit and the medicine is administered to the patient. And then it gives you time for, uh, or it gives you a spot to make comments. So you have this cover sheet. After you've got the cover sheet, you can look at these cover sheets and say, okay, where's the time? The order is placed in the pharmacy box, the tech pickup, order entry, et cetera. And what you see is this is where the major delays occur. So you discuss the data. You say, okay, why do we have these delays here? <coughs> so they discussed the reasons for the delay, and they discovered there was no standardized system that exists from unit to unit for flagging orders. In other words, each floor or unit of a hospital operated independently. They didn't have a standardized unit. So if people go around to pick up the orders, they have to look in different spots. And if you have a change in personnel, that can cause a problem. So records are located in different places. Charts are taken by the medical students, therapy departments, and attending physicians. Uh, in other words, if you take the chart from the patient's room and go off to study it in, in some way, and then you want to check against the chart, it's not there. So that causes a delay. So the team used a brainstorming technique. And the medical residents suggested that the house staff tear apart a two-part form and place it in the basket in the nursing unit. I don't really know exactly what that means. But in any case, they devised a pilot project to be limited to several nursing units and only the medicine house staff. The medical resident trained the house staff, and a pilot was conducted over a two-day period. So once again, you're testing the hypothesis that this will, in fact, produce an improvement. 
on the first day, almost 100% compliance, and the pro time in the process was reduced from up to six hours to zero. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. So, and the new process eliminated the need for the secretary to handle the orders, thus minimizing the opportunity for human error. Second day was a fiasco. The team hadn't taken into account that the medical service changed and a new batch of house staff arrived unprepared for the change in the process. I think what this means is you have two shifts, okay? So the people who worked in no one shift, they knew each other and they told each other what was going on. They didn't have any contacts with the people in the other shift, so when they showed up, they were completely lost. And this is why you always test it on a small scale and then test it more and more widely to make sure you really have a good uh, improvement. So the team was convinced that the process change will result in a major reduction. The pilot was continued for several weeks and then institutionalized. Then the team turned to additional process improvements, including order entry on the units by the pharmacist, medication dispensers on the units for routine drugs, and problems with missed doses immediately post-surgery. So the point, uh, well, I think that's, so what benefits were obtained? The nursing staff and pharmacy held a ceasefire since the beginning of the quality improvement team. Both groups learned that there are very real systems issues driving the people problems. In other words, it's not that people are lazy or dumb or irresponsible, but that, that, that the system needs to be improved. The house staff became more sensitive to the need to standardize their behavior in terms of the hospital system. And so you then take this knowledge and incorporate it throughout the organization from awareness, understanding, bonding, transformation, total inclusion. Okay, that's one good place to stop or I can keep going. Any questions? Do y'all see? How, yes? One question I have. Right. How do you set up a process so that you filter it so that they can properly process the information they're getting instead of going back to their own previous position saying there's too much information to get to and making poor decisions? So that's what I've seen happen in several organizations. Where there's so much information technically that they fall back on what they think's right and they selectively pick information from how they choose what they do. Instead of looking at all the information that they might have there. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, you don't have a microphone, so uh, for the purpose of DVD, I'll say. The, uh, <coughs> the question is, uh, how do you decide which information to pay attention to so that people don't get overwhelmed with too much information? And uh, I would probably look at that in terms of chunking of data. That is, um, a lot of attention has been paid to this under the framework of the uh, balanced scorecard, which is a performance management tool. Uh, and most of the discussion of that technique has focused on what are the variables that you look at. And it's very much related to these issue of dashboard indicators. This is the notion that it refers to the dashboard in your car that tells you the speed and the fuel and the uh, generator, et cetera. So what variables do you really need to have information about and what variables d are less important? I would suppose that that's something that uh, develops over time. Obviously, you would want to discuss and um, get different views on the subject. I would assume the indicators change over time. I don't know of any uh, standard solution to it other than to say that uh, the human brain does process just a small number of variables and um, you want to boil it down to the ones that really work. The whole idea of the balanced scorecard is that you go beyond financial indicators to also look at uh, personnel issues, customer satisfaction issues, process issues, uh, in order to get a more balanced view of what it is you're monitoring. So that's the in literature I would look at. Yes? Uh, maybe the, this, this technique of goal question metric could be used here as well, where you start first defining your goals mm -hmm. and then derive from that what metrics 
Yes. Yes, that's part of the balanced scorecard is, is to ask the question, are you um, monitoring the things that are essential to implementing the strategic plan? So, yeah, you definitely want to start with the goals, uh, the strategic plan, and then monitor the issues that are essential to that. And I'll say more about that as we go today. Other questions? Okay, well, let me uh, conclude uh, with just a little bit on organization charts. <clears throat> so let me wrap up this discussion with uh, a little bit on organizational structure. This is the organizational, or this is the concept of a process that I pointed out to you earlier that Deming used uh, when he spoke to the Japanese in 1950. And if you look at this process, uh, the normal organization chart of a hierarchy of divisions and reporting relationships and so forth does not show, uh, does show reporting relationships, a normal hierarchy does. It does not show the products or services provided, the customers served, the workflows, or the ways in which products and services uh, are delivered. In short, such a chart does not show what an organization does or whom they do it or how they do it. So that's the criticism that process improvement would make against the standard organization chart. The alternative of focusing on processes uh, groups logically related tasks uh, according to when they're performed, utilized resources, and, uh, and how they produce definitive results. So you have measurable inputs, value added, measurable outputs, and repeatable activity. This would help to answer the question of what information to look at. <clears throat> the limitations of hierarchical management, you have artificial goal establishment, namely people like to have their division grow relative to other divisions, but that may not be helpful to the organization as a whole. So you have this, uh, con these conflicts in terms of trying to optimize the subsystems as opposed to mo optimizing the system as a whole. You have a large coordinating activity to reconcile goals. Uh, managers tend to perceive other functions as enemies. Many issues fall between the cracks, and sometimes top management is often the only people working on low-level issues. If, however, you focus on processes and you try to reduce the time in the process, that is, you focus on fast cycle capability, uh, you often achieve a variety of uh, benefits. If you do it faster, you'll do it better by not uh, not by working faster, but by just squeezing delays out of the process. Just-in-time inventory is an example. Uh, meeting changing customer needs more effectively because you're responding more rapidly. You have fewer opportunities for mistakes, less work to self-manage. Uh, I think this one is very important, at least it has been in my life, that uh, the shift to email from telephones means people don't interrupt me so much and I can answer queries uh, at my own pace. Uh, you end up with less status reporting and less chance for Murphy's Law. So that's, once again, the, the focus on the um, process. Okay, then if you compare hierarchy and process, uh, in a hierarchy the focus is on reporting relationships and authority versus converting inputs into outputs. You have isolated budget requests versus collective budget requests for a whole uh, process. Uh, here measures tend to be actual versus budget, whereas here measures begin with the output and trace back. It's another thing, answer to the question of what to focus on. Uh, authority and responsibility are divided into functional units or profit centers versus authority and responsibility for output of a system. Here you have high level intervention and low level issues, and there you have the working level solves the low level issues. Only the top manager has the big picture, and the picture is expanded throughout. One of the things that's common uh, about all of the approaches that I will be showing you is the fact that the claim is that the method can be used at each level. So the claim is that each one of these points of view 
is a common language for the whole organization. It can be used at a low level and it can be used at a high level. Okay, so I suggest we take some, a few more questions and then take a break and come back and I will explain Stafford Beer's viable system model and Russ Acoff's interactive planning approach. Any other questions? Yes? You made a reference in your last, your last slide on uh, employing uh, just-in-time uh, delivery of material. Yeah. Our, our company started, when we, we reviewed just-in-time probably about 10 years ago, and it's not very obvious to me that it's really been very broadly embraced. Can you make a comment about, you know, in industry in general, how broadly is that? Is, is that a concept that really is getting broadly embraced? being successfully employed? Well, my understanding was that it, it was an idea that was invented by the Japanese and, and was brought to the United States. Uh, there may obviously be some limits in terms of when it's applicable and so forth. The basic idea, as I understand it, was that you reduce the amount of capital that you have invested in inventory. Uh, it does mean that you're far more vulnerable to disruptions of your supply chain. Uh, the advantage is that if you change your product uh, and so you change the parts that you need, then you don't have a large inventory that you have to scrap. So you have pros and cons, but the, the disruption of the supply, ch the supply chain would certainly be an issue uh, if, well, the, uh, my understanding was that back in the days of Y2K, uh, people were very uncertain whether their suppliers would be able to function uh, after the date change in the year 2000, and so they built up their inventories. And consequently, what you had uh, after the date change was what was called an inventory recession, that people had to use up those inventories, and so they weren't sending in orders, and so the economy uh, dropped, um, which was part of the drop, uh, part of the uh, cause of the uh, bursting of the high-tech bubble was that people spent very heavily on new information technology because they were unable to fix the old information technology. So there was a great deal of spending on information technology which would have been distributed over a longer period of time had they anticipated the date change problem earlier. But since they didn't, they overshot on uh, buying high-tech equipment. And then you had the inventory bubble which was caused by uncertainty. And so the economy dropped more broadly than just the, uh, the high-tech uh, economy. So, yeah, in terms of just-in-time inventory, I would say that your inventory, the, the, um, the issue is both the disruption in uh, supply chains and the, uh, the amount of money that you have tied up in inventory. And so you just have to make a judgment. Is it your sense now that J JIT is broadly employed? You know, or is it kind of I think it's an idea that's, uh, that's been distributed within the business community. Uh, that is, uh, I think the Japanese introduced the notion that you could reduce inventory uh, by having very close supplier relationships. The Americans, and this goes back a couple decades, uh, did not have that idea as well established because the American idea was that you go with the low-cost supplier, whereas the Japanese idea was that you work closely with your suppliers and um, you have a kind of extended organization where the suppliers are almost a part of your organization. Uh, so that was a, a cultural shift that was at least introduced to the American system and American managers adopted it uh, to the extent that they found it appropriate over here. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Yes? Could you give us uh, criteria uh, to identify the offend the hierarchy is better and the plan the process will be better? Uh -huh. <clears throat> well, once again, this is an, uh, a, a matter of introducing an idea, and then you have to use your judgment about when the idea is appropriate. <clears throat> I'd say before 
1980 in the United States, American managers thought in terms of hierarchies. And they did not think that much in terms of processes. But there are great advantages, as I indicated, to thinking in terms of processes. Now, they may not always, I mean, that may not be the best way to set up your organization. Um, you may very well want to have your normal divisions of engineering, personnel, et cetera. Um, the next thing that I will tell you, uh, Stafford Beer's viable system model is an alternative organizational design. It's an alternative both to the standard hierarchy and to the process. Uh, but the claim is that <coughs> you can analyze an organization in terms of Stafford Beer's viable system model regardless of the particular organization that they use. Now, one alternative to the process versus the hierarchy is a matrix organization. And Russ Acoff has said that he loves matrix organizations because they generate so much consulting income for him that uh, most of his, or, or a large part of his work has come from fixing organizations that adopted a matrix approach. Uh, so I, th I think it would be safe to say he wouldn't recommend uh, a matrix. Uh, approach to organization. But I'll show you uh, later after the break Stafford Beer's viable system model and that'll give you some new ways of thinking about the uh, uh, organizational structure. Other questions? Well, if there are no questions now, uh, what we might do is to take a moment and go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves again so that you know who's here. Can we do that very quickly? I think we've added a few people. Why don't we start over here? Just say who you are, where you're from, and so forth. David Ostrowski. I'm from Ford Motor Research, Dearborn, Michigan. Yeah. I am, I am Zhang Zijie. Uh, I'm from China. Uh, and I am a visiting scholar uh, at IIT now. Okay, good, thank you. Speak so everybody can hear you. I'm Wang Jingyu, you and Queen Xiu. I come from Dongnan University of Technology, Taipei, Taiwan. How is Wang State University in New York, Bing Gang Chun? Engineering. I'm from a body design college. Now I'm in the University of Sweden. Okay. Right. Speak a little louder. CK Ma uh, from Taiwan, National Jiaotong University. Okay. And Thank you. I'm Joseph Man. I'm working for Alpha Solutions, which is a technology office uh, based in Hampton, Belgium, and also teaching at the University of Leicester in software management. Jorge Baral, uh, I am from Simon Bolivar University in Caracas, Venezuela. I am a retired professor in the Information and Computer Science. I'm Bob Brandstetter. I'm a controls engineer with Hexagon Metrology and I'm a service designer. I'm Lalita, working for the Technology Senior and Senior Engineer. I'm Jeremy Pasquale, IT expert from Prometheus. I'm Anita Rema from Pontiac Institute of Information and Technology, Pasha. I'm in teaching management and I'm a PhD scholar. And I'm Gilda Bobista, I am an assistant professor and working in the University of Mind Metallurgy in Caracas, Florida. I'm Angelica, uh, Czech Technical University, 
craft, Europe, uh, and I'm uh, engaged in this imaging and uh, communication. Okay. My name is Maria Lukova. I am from University of Lublina, Slovak Republic, and uh, I live with this medium. Okay. I'm Brian Lubitsky, University of Lublina, Slovak Republic, also using that picture to control the Okay, thank you. I'm Claudio Popolan, University of Cairo, Romania, Assistant Professor on Advanced Programming Studies. My name is Ed Sanazma. Uh, I'm from the Southern University of Taiwan. I'm Mo Xin Yun. I'm also from the National Jiang University of Taiwan. Okay. Well, thank you very much for telling us who you are. I hope in the break we'll have a chance to meet each other. This is a very impressive group of people, so I, I think we'll have some great discussions. Thank you. Let's take a break and, and come back uh, in about 15 minutes.